U.S. has many sources of soft power, U.S. music, Hollywood, so on and so forth. And besides that, the key aspect of U.S. Uh, hegemony is its legitimacy. And that legitimacy comes from two sources. One is democracy and the other is multilateralism. So the fact that the United States is a democracy and at least claims to be. Of course, when you look at the fine print, you will find that the US currently does not even rank as a full democracy on the democracy index. It's at number 30. It's a struggling democracy. But the fact that there's so much of rhetoric that even Joe Biden at the moment says that the world is divided into two groups. One is a democratic group and the other is authoritarian group. But if you actually look at the many countries do not really qualify as democracies. Uh, but nevertheless, as part of the talking points. But it's also about ideas. It's also about ideas. If you look at some of the biggest things that have happened to us in the past few years, I mean, planes, for example, air travel, nuclear weapons. Have you all watched Oppenheimer? I did. I need to see it again because I need to go back and reread the history of quantum physics and then watch it again because there's some very important scientists who are portrayed in Oppenheimer. But if you look at it, this is what the US was able to do in the 1940s. Huge, massive project. So the US brings a lot of ideas to the human condition, not just to world politics. The internet, you know Al Gore invented internet? That's a joke in the US. <laughs> internet was something that created in the 1980s, 70s and 80s by US Department of Defense, and then afterwards it was privatized and you have out there. So some of the biggest ideas out there that you see are also coming, except TikTok, I think everything else is coming from the US. Whether it's Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> Elon Musk, we took him to America and now he's producer of such amazing technology, and so on and so forth. So these ideas, American con con investment in sciences, investment in multilateral institutions, etc., are also sources of the legitimacy that makes America a hegemon. So what kind of a global order has this hegemon created? So the United States is like an imperial power that does not rule by direct context. We don't conquer the world. We influence the world through multilateral institutions. So all the multilateral institutions that are part of global governance, whether it's the UN Security Council, the United Nations, World Bank, IMF, etc., you find that they are all heavily under US influence. It's only in the UN where the US influence has declined significantly in the General Assembly, but at least in the Security Council, the US, along with France and uh, Britain has a 3-2 advantage over East. So the West dominates the East 3-2 in the UN Security Council. So the US has built a world order based on multilateralism, which gives a lot of US activities legitimacy. But after 9-11, when the US could not get the whole world on its side, and so we started inventing new words like a coalition of the willing and so on and so forth. That was because the world was already beginning to resist the US-backed global order. When we talk of world orders, we talk of it basically on the basis of distribution of power. So for example, after 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you could argue that we were living in a world which was unipolar. The United States was a dominant power, unchallenged economically, politically, or in any other way. Some people say the unipolarity ended on 9-11 in 2001. Other people say, no, it ended with the economic crisis in 2008. Uh, some people say, well, the two wars that are happening right now are basically trying to put an end to the unipolarity of the United States. And of course, you know what a bipolar system is during the Cold War when there are two competing powers. And then there's multipolarity. These days you hear more and more countries talk about the world as a multipolar world. The moment you hear the word multipolar world, you must understand that it is code for a world 
not dominated by U.S. So when a country says, we are living in a multipolar world, they're saying, can we get rid of the U.S., please? Uh, you hear that a lot from India. You hear that from France. So these are people who are irritated by American domination. But if you were to be living in a multipolar world, then you wouldn't have seen the war that is going on in Gaza right now. It's genocidal. Okay. What, 13,000 civilians killed, 5,000 children killed with F-16s and rockets and missiles, sponsored by the United States, funded by the United States, legitimized by the United States, legally defended by the United States. It's like saying that if you take my car, if you take my gun, if you take my credit card, then you drive, fill the car with gas using my credit card, and then you go and commit a massacre with my guns. And when people accuse you of a massacre, I send my lawyers to protect you. Then I have some culpability to what you have done. And you're witnessing that. But where are the so-called other powers? Where are the Russian submarines? Where are the Russian aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean? Where are the Chinese? Where are Indians? Where are the French? French, at least in the Security Council, they have taken positions which are contrary to the United States. And so have Russia and China. But other than pushing resolutions which they themselves know will be vetoed by the US, there are no c concrete efforts made by any of these powers to restrain the United States. And that tells me that we are not living in a multipolar world. The US doesn't feel the need to consult with Russia or China or France uh, or India before it makes whatever commitments it's making right now. So in that sense, you can see that you are still, when it comes to at least military capabilities and economic capabilities, you're still living in a unipolar moment. So that is an important aspect. And you could say that you're saying that because you're an American. No, I'm a very big critic of American foreign policy, but I, I, I see the world as it is. And I, right now, when I look at it, it doesn't look like a multipolar world. If it was a multipolar world, the US would have first consulted with other powers before giving all the green lights to Israel to whatever is happening. But the good news is that there's a temporary ceasefire and there's going to be exchange of host hostages and things that might look better. So what are the challenges to this multi-order? The first and fundamental challenge is the fact that the US has gone from 50% of the global economy to 25% of the global economy. That itself tells you view that the gap between one and two has reduced. So if you look at the, during the Cold War, the US was still around 40% of the global economy, and the Soviet Union was never above 12%. So the gap was huge between the one and two, but that's not the case anymore. The gap is very narrow. But if you make adjustment for purchasing power capacity, you will find that China's economy has already surpassed that of the US. So China, in terms of within its domestic context, can do more with money than the U US can do. So the, so the gap is reducing between one and two. But there are other things that are happening in this world. The pandemic, for example, it is really testing the leadership of the United States. And unfortunately, we had Mr. Donald Trump at that time. So if you look at the Ebola crisis, the leadership role that Do uh, Joe, uh, Barack Obama played, and the complete absence of US leadership in the early days of the coronavirus crisis, it tells you that the United States was conceding the leadership role that it, it normally plays. The world was not looking to the US at that time. And that is a big danger. And that danger comes from a growing trend in the United States where more and more people are thinking in terms of America first. So if you look at not just Donald Trump, but if you listen to, say, Vivek Ramaswamy, who was running for president on the Republican side, this insistence that America first, as if other presidents were coming and saying, I am running for the president of the United States, and my agenda is Europe first, or Israel first, or Asia first. No one ever says that. The only thing they say is, by strengthening Asia, we strengthen America. But now, America first means we will strengthen America and we don't care what happens to the rest of you. And that you saw in the absence of US leadership in the early days of the coronavirus crisis. So the climate change issue with Donald Trump withdrawing from the Paris Accords, et cetera, was a blow to the global efforts to fight the environment. 
And then, of course, we reversed that after Joe Biden became president. So you have climate change kind of issues, pandemic issues, which are global in nature. So when President Biden talks about the relationship with China and says, look, we compete geopolitically, but we should cooperate on the issue of climate change and pandemics, which are global in nature. And if the US and China do not cooperate, then we're not really going to be able to address these issues with as much effectiveness as we really need to do. So those are the two challenges which are, shall we say, global, planetary in nature. But then you have two other kinds of things. We, for a long time, we thought that interstate battles and interstate wars were over. And the dominant threat security was coming from non-state actors. So more and more states versus terrorist groups across the world, or dissident groups, whatever you want to call them. But now, suddenly, we are living in a world where you have both. You have interstate and intrastate. So for example, to take the case of Pakistan fighting the Taliban. Across the border, over the border issues, there's a huge border dispute between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Not many people are noticing, but Pakistan is <coughs> deporting hundreds of thousands of people. They have threatened to deport about 1.7 million Afghans. And they've already started the process. If the war, the Israel war was not happening, the media would have focused on that as the number one humanitarian crisis that we are facing today. So you can see fighting Taliban across the border and fighting Taliban inside the border is an example of the kind of world we are living in. So that is one challenge. And then the challenge is also about technology. So for example, Iranian drones have played havoc with Ukraine. And Turkish drones helped Ukraine defend Kiev in the early part of the war. Turkish drones upset the balance between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So suddenly you have not so major powers leapfrogging on technology. That is a very interesting development. So you could take a small segment of technology and specialize it and suddenly catch up with world powers. If you have a smart group of 20 people in your university who make some breakthroughs on AI, you will be a superpower. Not economically, not militarily, but you could have, you know, the whole series of Tom Cruise's latest mission, Impossible, is about this threat uh, of artificial intelligence bringing the world down to its knees because it can hack the world. So you could have a small bunch of people. So this threat of technology can also upset the global balance of power. And then there is another interesting thing that the US itself is responsible for undermining its own global order, is the abuse of the institutions that it developed. So for example, uh, the use of SWIFT. I don't know if you know what SWIFT is, transactions between countries of exchange of money. The US weaponized all these institutions against Russia after Russia acquired. These are institutions created for global cooperation. So when we were marketing SWIFT, we said, this is good for everybody. Well, no. Now you suddenly discover, no, it's not good for anybody. The US can use that as a weapon against you. And let me tell you, Russia, China, no one couldn't use that as a weapon against the US. So the institutions that the United States created to bring legitimacy to itself and the global order that it supports, it started weaponizing that and undermine the legitimacy of that very order. And by undermining the legitimacy of that order, the US is contributing to the collapse of that particular order. So this is an important point that one of the challenges to the US order is the US itself. To give you one interesting example, the US has been working very hard to punish Russia for what it is doing in Ukraine. And so they are create, trying to create a special court which will prosecute the Russians for war crimes in Ukraine. And those special courts are going to have to be cleared by the United Nations. So the United Nations will have to vote, the General Assembly will have to vote, and suddenly now the, US real, uh, the world realizes that every time that issue is going to come up, that court will also apply to Israel. So if you're going to punish people for bombing civilian targets, like hospitals, 
The Russians bombed the hospital yesterday. Why do you think they did it? Because now they feel they can do it because Israel does it. No international order courts are going to prosecute Russia because if they prosecute Russia, they will have to prosecute Israel and the U.S. would rather destroy international institutions. The U.S. has withdrawn from international organizations to protect Israel. So this weaponization and double standards in the application of the global order is one reason why the order is not as strong as it ought to be. So the double standards that the U.S. itself has implemented uh, using abusing its own Security Council veto uh, and also some of the institutions that it has created, I think, are contributing to its decline. So what's coming next? What's at the end of the tunnel? People keep saying that we are in the tunnel. Do we see a light? Do we see something else coming out of it? So this is a very dangerous situation in that sense that if we see the decline of the United States, it doesn't mean that the order that is going to emerge is going to be good for everybody. We don't know what it is, but try imagine a world dominated by China and Russia. Would you like that? So, one of the classes that I took in my PhD program was on American foreign policy. I made the life of the professor miserable for like the first year. Every time he tried to talk about the principal move of the US, I would give an example of hypocrisy. So he would say, the United States is, believes in rule of law. I said, really? And give an example. Well, what rule of law are you talking about? <laughs> You're starving people in Gaza. This is genocide happening in front of your eyes. So, um, but those are older examples. So on the fourth or fifth week of the semester, the professor was totally frustrated with me. I thought he was going to throw me out of the class. He picked up a fat book. I thought, oh shit, he's going to hit me with it. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, take this. This is American power. Take it. Now give it to a country of your choice. That was a very interesting moment in my life. I was an international student. I was not an American citizen. Who would I give that power to? Russia? <laughs> Certainly not. One of the good things coming out of this is that Russia's imperial ambitions are getting a, a wake-up call. They say without Ukraine, Russia is not an empire. It's a third world country with nuclear weapons. With Ukraine, it's an empire. That's Brzezinski. But so he gives me this and says, this is American power. Which country would you like to give it to? I, I, I didn't know what to do with it. I had just come from India, four months. I knew enough about India not to give it to India. <laughs> so if I couldn't give it to my own country, who would I give the American power to? He said, take your time. The class has two more hours. At the end of the two hours, I want to know who you want to give the power to. Well, I had no answer, so I gave it back to America. Of course, later on, other professors told me, oh, you were so stupid. You should have dismantled American power and distributed it to other forms, international organizations. You should have given some to the UN. You should have given some to the UN, UN UNESCO. I, I didn't think through that point. But that is a very serious question for all the countries who are delighting in the declining power of the United States to say that, <laughs> be careful what you're wishing for. What comes next? The US has been definitely quite arrogant in its domination of the world. The US is also quite demanding. The U.S. also abandons allies. Look how we abandon Afghanistan. We, we abandon Mosul. And I think we have abandoned Ukraine now. Nobody covers Ukraine anymore since this Israeli war has happened. But that doesn't mean that the alternatives out there are better. So one of my former countrymen, Amitava Acharya, talks about something called the multiplex order rather than a multipolar order, trying to say that, well, other countries can bring other ideas to the table. They can bring civilizations to the table. They can bring culture and values. Uh, where are they right now? Where is the civilization of India and China in the Israel-Hamas war? 
or in the Russia-Ukraine war. Where are the ideas? I, I see no new ideas coming out of anywhere, frankly. So this idea that we live in a multiplex world where not everybody is powerful and other countries are able to exert and influence power through culture, through ideas, through values, through norms, uh, is not exactly visible. But there's something happening. There's a fragmentation happening. And the fragmentation is both international and subnational. So for example, if you look at the surveys of American public opinion when the war started, around October 10, October 11, and if you look at the surveys now, you can see that American, American society is fracturing on this, and there's a polarization taking place. And the polarization is also taking place in the Democratic Party. And on the two wars also you can see the fracture like uh, President Obama, uh, President Biden requested $109 billion, 61 for Ukraine, 14 and a half for Israel, uh, and the Republican Congress basically said we are going to split the two, and they passed the one for Israel, and they clearly are not going to pass the one uh, for Ukraine. So you can see that the American elite, the American population, are fracturing at home. And then if you listen to, to Macron, and if you listen to Schulz of Germany. I was listening to Schulz talk about it, and I was stunned. It's like he has an off switch to his brain and an off switch to his conscience. And he put them both off while he was saying, and we see that Israel is committing no war crimes. And that is what we are going to say at every forum and all the time. I said, this is all of Schulz. He has no sense of morality, and that's how I understood that Germans were capable of the Holocaust because they are unable to make moral decisions when it matters. And then you hear Macron, he's on the opposite end of the spectrum in Europe at least. So even Europe is fragmenting in their opinions on this particular war. So you see domestic level fragmentation in societies, you see fragmentation in the international level, and that is not good for the US because the US believes in what is called force multiplier. And the force multiplier is these alliances and allies that it accumulates. So the U.S. alliance with Europe is critical for its global hegemony in global order. So for example, if the U.S. says, I'm going to war with China and I want my friends to come, there will be many friends who will join the U.S. in that war and is trying to cultivate a new friend called India. And then when China says, I'm going to war with the U.S., I want my friends to come, who is going to come? Who will fight with China against the U.S.? I can't think of anybody. But I can think of many countries who will join a U.S. war with China. I can think of Australia. I can think of Japan. I can think of NATO. 31 countries, right? So suddenly the U.S. has bigger force and bigger power than it, than it is. But the fracturing of that makes it weaker. So the order which it is created and is trying to enforce through this is happening. So coming to these two wars, first of all, I'm personally very disappointed that the United States has failed to initiate a peace process in both the wars. There has been no steps taken by the U.S. to bring about peace. Putin yesterday suddenly started talking as if he's a global statesman. War is a tragedy, blah, blah. So these so-called competing powers, they are also quite hypocritical. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi became so famous for make, saying this is not an era of war. But now when it comes to the Israeli-Hamas issue, he, he has not repeated it even once. He's not said it once that this is not an era of war. What happened to that sentiment? He's keeping quiet on that issue. So you see all these leaders making hypocritical decisions. But the US has not initiated any peace process with Russia because the US sees the war in Ukraine as basically scaring Europe. Russia scares Europe, so Europe gets in aligned with the US. You run to daddy. We are selling billions of dollars worth of F-35s across Europe now because Russia has scared them. It's good for the US economy. You were buying cheap Russian gas <laughs> and Russian oil. Now you're buying expensive American uh, gas. 
thanks to this whole response to the Ukrainian war. And the joke in some parts of the world is that America is going to fight Russia till the last Ukrainian. It's the Ukrainians who are getting destroyed, not America. And most of the money that we are giving as military aid, where do you think it is going? It's going to American companies. Today I learned that since the war started, Ukrainian holdings of U.S. Treasury bonds has doubled. So first, the military money and weapons that we are giving to Ukraine is coming to all American companies. You're buying American javelins and whatever weapons, most of it from the U.S. All the money the Europeans are spending on weapons for Ukraine, most of it is also coming to the U.S. You know, I think it was Estonia or Latvia which raised $200 million to buy javelins from America and give it in the first early days of the war. So the money is coming to the U.S. But the aid that we're giving directly to Ukraine in humanitarian aid, they're taking that money and buying U.S. Treasury bonds. And I don't understand what the... I just read it this morning, and I'm going to investigate and figure, like, why is that money not being used for humanitarian crises, or what is that money for, and why are they buying U.S. Treasury bonds? Is this some... I, I don't understand what, why that is happening. So that is one problem with the Ukrainian. And so the U.S. has been selling it as promotion of democracy. Ukraine was never a democracy. You, uh, Ukraine and Russia were in the same category as hybrid regimes with a lot of uh, corruption in Ukraine. It was so corrupt that right now the Ukrainians had to fire all the Ministry of Defense people in order to get the next tranche of money from the U.S. because of corruption during the war in Ukraine. But the U.S. is promoting it as a struggle, a war between democracy and authoritarianism. Now all of that is collapsing with the Hamas Israel. All the U.S. moral rhetoric in Ukraine is now being sort of overturned by this United States in many ways unconditional and uncritical support of a war that increasingly looks as a very genocidal war. So I think these two wars are going to go a long way in undermining U.S. hegemony and undermining the very order on which U.S. hegemony was based. It could also impact uh, American elections in 2024. Already the latest polls show that Trump is leading Biden in all critical states and in national polls also. And in the latest polls, they have started asking the question, First, it was all about Biden's age, but now it's about Biden's role in this war. So the connection of the sudden dip in Biden's popularity is connected to the war. But Americans don't vote on foreign policy. They vote on domestic politics. So unfortunately, in spite of the fact that the U.S. economy has done significantly well this quarter, 4.9%, unemployment is very low at 3.5%, uh, 75% to 76% of Americans think and feel that the country is going in the opposite direction. So, we, we might see some kind of uh, change in 2024 elections. That doesn't mean that what's going to happen, I mean, we are unhappy with what the U.S. currently is doing, but that doesn't mean that whoever is going to replace Biden is going to be better, especially if it's Donald Trump, who then you will once again have America first, and I don't know what that says to the world order. So I'm going to stop with that and be happy to take questions and comments. And as my phone says, it's 41 minutes, so I think I was on time. Thank you.